Okay. Um, well, I want to thank everyone who I've met with today, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I've had a great visit so far today. Uh, it's not over yet. Um, so in thinking about what I was going to talk about today, uh, I run the division of transfusion medicine in the pathology department at Penn. Uh, I, there's a clinical operation that uh, I'm an, I, I run and I'm an attending in. Uh, I also have a research lab. In my research lab, I do uh, immunology research. I use a technology called phage display, uh, which is used for cloning uh, antibodies, uh, in particular cloning human antibodies from patients uh, with um, autoimmune diseases. Um, and, uh, and I'm not going to be talking about that today. Um, I, I, what, I, what, I was, what I'm going to talk about is something that I've been thinking about a lot and I think would be uh, appealing to a more general audience here. Uh, it has a lot to do with um, uh, my, my thoughts about where pathology is headed um, in the future, um, that it's not just the Department of Diagnostics, but the Department of Therapeutics, um, how um, a lot of the things that we've been doing um, that have its origins in, in blood banking are now expanding into other kinds of therapies. And um, we're in the process of building another large um, GMP facility. I just got $10 million to build a facility next to our apheresis unit, meeting hours, many hours every week designing it. And so I've been thinking a lot about this area and thinking a lot about personalized medicine and what people think about personalized medicine. And so I thought that's what I would talk about today, sort of what I've been thinking about, um, and how the, the role of transfusion medicine has been expanding uh, into personalized medicine. And so personalized medicine is something uh, that a lot of people talk about. And, in, and I think there's really two kinds of personalized medicine. One would be um, doing various kinds of molecular assays, genetic assays on a, on a particular patient or on a, or on a patient's tumor, and figuring out what is the best um, therapy, what drug therapy for that, or how to best dose a drug. Uh, in, a, in, in, in an individualized way. But the drug that you're using is still something that's mass manufactured by a pharmaceutical company, uh, something still off the shelf that you get from the pharmacy. And what we've been doing in transfusion medicine is a different kind of personalized medicine, which is where we're actually manufacturing the therapy for the patient from the patient's own cells, and in many cases using the patient's own tumor to help create um, the therapy that we're, we're giving. And so it's a different kind of personalized medicine that I think is going to be very important in the future. And I think my, my main point is that I think this kind of thing should sit with pathology because it's an extension of transfusion medicine, which is a discipline of pathology. And so um, the, the, the marketing people at Penn realized this um, sooner than the administrators because this is actually a billboard that was on the uh, Walt, Whitman, Walt Whitman Bridge uh, going from New Jersey into um, Pennsylvania. And it really sort of summarizes what I was just saying. And this is sort of in the area of, of cancer uh, therapeutics. Um, and so what, I, what I'm going to talk about over the next 50 minutes or so is sort of give a, a historical perspective of um, what I see as uh, the growing involvement of transfusion medicine and personalized medicine, and some of the experience that we've had at Penn. And I'll give a couple of examples of um, some of the things that we're doing that illustrate this, and then some of the issues um, to confront when one is thinking about um, doing this in one's own institution. So this is from a, uh, uh, from a JAMA article of my former mentor, Les Silberstein, at Penn, and it's, it's, it's tracing the uh, evolution of transfusion medicine from the discovery of the ABO blood groups uh, and, and basically uh, transfusion medicine were, was comprised uh, uh, transfusion of, of uh, red cells, plasma, and platelets, uh, purifying clotting factors from plasma, getting into the idea that you could use uh, recombinant uh, methods for producing factors, uh, the whole uh, area of transfusion safety and testing of the blood for infectious diseases came about. And then when we started doing things in the 1980s, uh, get purifying um, populations of stem cells from bone marrow or collecting them by phoresis got into the whole uh, transplant area. And now what, what, is, what is developing is um, actually uh, 
uh, isolating different fractions of cells and, and using them to create new forms of therapy. So the way it started was a transfusion service uh, with a blood bank and an hematology reference lab, I mean, a hematology laboratory, and we would do agglutination in tubes, and we would, uh, the first form of personalized therapy would be um, something that was uh, 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 typed to match a patient. It could be the patient's own cells if it was an autologous collection. Uh, and then apheresis units developed for uh, therapeutic procedures, but then um, this is an apheresis machine. I know you don't do apheresis here, um, but you probably have seen one uh, before. Um, and, uh, and then you can use these machines to collect hematopoietic um, progenitor cells. And so uh, you need then a laboratory to process those cells. And so we began to develop those. Um, this is an example of a patient Instead of going to the operating room and having bone marrow taken out, he's just sitting in bed in our apheresis unit. His wife is sitting in the bed with him, and he's, uh, if he's not talking to me, he's just watching TV, and he's having his uh, peripheral blood stem cells collected. Um, and then uh, they go to our lab, where various uh, samples are taken for quality control purposes. Uh, eventually, the, the, the cells are frozen, um, and this has grown to be a really large uh, enterprise, um, we did over 600 apheresis collections last year. Uh, it's created a problem running out of freezer space. Um, we always collect more cells than wound up going back into the patients, and we have to actually uh, rent f uh, freezer space in the state of Delaware for over a million dollars to have this freezer farm uh, to because uh, we don't have enough space in our hospital for all the freezers. Um, and then um, this used to be a really big deal. When I was a resident, the resident used to go to the patient's room and, and do this. But now um, this individual here is, is, a, is one of our techs, and he wheels a, a liquid nitrogen doer with stem cells uh, into the patient's room and a 37-degree water bath, and one by one uh, thaws the bags and then hands each bag to, um, to what used to be a hematologist in this uh, video, but now it's just a, a nurse. So it's sort of a very trivial um, thing that's done hundreds of times a year in my institution. Uh, they just identified that it was the right bag for that patient, which is an important thing to do. And, um, and she just pushes the, the cells uh, into the patient who's connected to the, the piece of tubing up here, and you'll see that in a second. So this is a patient here in the bed who has had his uh, hematopoietic system totally ablated, and he requires these cells to uh, reconstitute his hematopoietic system. And so this used to be um, a big deal, and now it's fairly trivial. Uh, and this uh, was sort of the first kind of uh, uh, expansion out of the red cells, platelets, plasma stuff that we did in the blood bank. So um, then this capability of harvesting cells from patients and doing things with the cells led to various kinds of clinical trials. Um, and to do fancier kind of things with the cells, you need um, what they call a GMP facility, um, facilities that are, have clean rooms that you have to gown up to go into these facilities. Um, and, um, and so in, in, in the way we were sort of evolving ourselves at Penn, this is sort of what was going acro uh, across the country. So the ABB, American Association of Blood Banks, itself in 2004 re redefined itself. It said the board concluded that while our acronym AABB enjoys strong brand recognition, our name American Association of Blood Banks no longer accurately depicts the organization, our members, or the changing field of transfusion medicine. Going forward, AABB will be known as AABB, Without spelling out American Association of Blood Banks, instead we have adopted a tagline, Advancing Transfusion and Cellular Therapies Worldwide, to help describe who we are and what we do. The tagline will accompany a revised logo to signify these changes. And so anyone who's in the ABB recognizes this logo now. And so this is basically the idea that we don't want to be thought of as just red cells, plasma, and platelets anymore. So the, the typical process flow for a cellular therapy protocol generally starts off with um, a pheresis machine and a patient uh, and a cell product. And then the cells go uh, into a lab and go into some kind of device that will um, uh, enrich or deplete or isolate certain cells of interest. 
the cells might be, um, then go into some kind of culture setting to uh, stimulate the cells or to insert genes into them. Um, this is something I'll talk about a little bit later, but these are something that was developed at Penn, which are magnetic beads that have anti-CD3 and anti-CD28 on them that act as artificial um, antigen-presenting cells to, to, to stimulate the growth of cells. And then um, these newer devices that have been developed for cultivating large amounts of cells, um, instead of incubators with CO2, uh, CO2 incubators with lots of flasks, you, um, right out in the open you can have these large bags that are heated from beneath and rocking like this and have tubes feeding them. And you can have them all lined up on a bench, growing liters and liters of patient cells. And then um, following that, it goes into some kind of device for harvesting the cells, and washing the cells. Um, and there really aren't equipment, uh, really isn't pieces of equipment dedicated to a lot of these processes. So this thing right here is a cell washer that is designed for use in the operating room for cell salvage during, during surgery. So we use one of those to wash the cells. Then there's a lot quality control um, samples taken out depending on the protocol, and then the cells are reinfused into the patient. And so this is a typical kind of process flow for a more complicated type of cellular therapy um, pr procedure. And so at Penn, we, we have this facility, we call it the CVPF, the uh, Clinical Vaccine Production Facility. And this is uh, just an example of the areas that we've gotten ourselves involved in. And we're not the only ones in the country that do this, but I'm just going to be talking about what I know, which is what we do here. And um, there's a whole, at the, at the moment, there's a very broad range, even so far, in the kinds of um, diseases that we're involved in. Um, in, in. There's a large area of focus on creating things called dendritic cell vaccines, where uh, we collect mononuclear cells by apheresis from a patient. They go to the lab. And for, for uh, breast cancer, um, dendritic cells from the patient's um, product are stimulated with recombinant HER2 new protein and um, to educate these uh, dendritic cells or to expose them to the, this antigen. And then uh, essentially a vaccine is made, or it's called a vaccine, it's injected into the breast cancer patient where it um, stimulates an immune response in the patient. And what I, I got an email yesterday that tonight on the 6.30, whenever it is here, CBS Evening News, there's going to be a story on this particular trial. Um, this isn't my trial. I run the, involved in running the lab that does this. I'm not the PI, but um, I got a, a memo that he's going to be on TV tonight. So I'll be on TV with my talk at 2 in the morning at the <laughs> U, UW uh, thing. Okay. So anyway, um, but, but there are other kinds of vaccines for ovarian cancer where you don't really know what the antigen is. So we essentially make uh, an extract or milkshake of the of actual tumor taken out of the patient um, when she was debulked from ovarian cancer and that at some later point that extract from the tumor is fed to the dendritic cells. And so dendritic cell vaccines are made for ovarian cancer. Uh, and we have other things for other forms of cancer. Um, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about uh, two things in a little more detail. The first one I just want to mention is something that was published this summer that got a lot of um, press, which was a treatment for uh, CLL, which, um, and let me see, yeah, so uh, again, um, you know, this is work of people in my division who are using our lab to, um, to create the cells. Some of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, so I'm just going to mention what this thing is, a chimeric antigen uh, receptor. So um, if you remember from immunology, um, uh, so T cells have this thing called the T cell receptor, which doesn't directly recognize an antigen. It, it recognizes a, a piece of an antigen in the context of MHC. Um, and so the trick here was to want to get someone's T cells to attack their tumor. Um, and what was made was, an, was a, an artificial type of T cell receptor where this signaling domain of the T cell receptor here was linked to something called 4-1-BB, which is something that helps the cells persist in the body. And then, but the key thing was on the outside here, instead of the normal T cell receptor, is, it was actually an antibody to CD19. And so essentially, um, T cells were harvested from CLL patients by phoresis. Uh, the T cells were transfected using a lentivirus with a construct that would express this thing called a T-body, or CART-19, chimeric antigen receptor against CD19, in the membrane. Um, the cells were um, 
expanded using, these are these magnetic beads that have anti-CD3 and anti-CD28 on them. And then these cells were put um, back into these patients. And these were, there were three um, patients that were treated so far with C, advanced CLL, who had, had gotten all the possible treatments you could have gotten um, at that time, you know, up to that point, and they were, uh, they had no other options. Um, and the, um, this is results from one of the patients. So in July 31st, 2010, uh, this is what his bone marrow um, looked like, um, extensive involvement with CLL. And then he, and, um, he, he then got injected with um, about a, um, a billion of these transduced cells. So these are his own cells that have this chimeric antigen receptor in it. And it looks like about four weeks later, this is what his bone marrow looked like. And during the, this four-week period, he had been admitted to the hospital with fever. And it looked like he was basically, the thought was that he was dying from CLL. And this thing didn't work, when in fact, this was tumor lysis syndrome. And he lost two pounds of tumor. Um, so it, uh, and, and it turns out that these cells of his are still there in his body. And so there were two, he and one other person were complete remissions. And then there's a third person who's a partial remission. And there's seven other patients that are currently being treated. Um, so this raises the possibility um, of a, um, you know, a, a treatment for CLL. Um, the other thing it raises is the idea that you can use this technique with an antibody to some other, other than CD19, to something else, to mesothelian or something else that are, is on some other kind of cancer. Uh, and that is actually being done now for pancreatic uh, cancer. There's a lot of questions about whether this actually would work uh, well in other kinds of cancer because this meth this technique destroyed all of the patient's uh, CD19 positive cells. So he has no B cells at all, which um, may not be a bad thing um, in general. And also, it might be the reason why he's not mounting an immune response against this chimeric antigen receptor that's in his cells. So that might mean that this won't work if you try to kill pancreatic cancer because the person's B cells will be there to. So there's a lot of questions we don't know about whether this will work in other kinds of cancers. But it's just to give you a sense of, of one of the kinds of things that um, the people are doing, working on. Um, then the thing I want to spend a little more time on is talking about something that we're in the middle of, which is a treatment for HIV. Um, and so. Um, it involves something called zinc finger endonuclease. Does anybody know what a zinc finger is? Good. All right. So, and then I can say anything I want. And, uh, OK. So first, if we just talk about HIV. Um, so HIV uh, infects T cells, as you know. And one of the co-receptors to infect is, uh, is called CCR5, right here. And one thing that you probably know is that around 1% of Caucasians lack CCR5. People know that? And, um, and therefore are resistant to HIV. And there doesn't seem to be, so I'm sure somebody in the room here is probably CCR5 negative and doesn't, doesn't know it. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any downside to being um, one of these 1% of people. Um, so what if you could take an HIV-infected person and somehow turn them into a, um, a CCR5 negative person by putting in a, a mutation in the same region of the gene that naturally occurs in about 1% of Caucasians. Um, you would expect that they wouldn't have any ne negative side effect from doing this, and then any cells that were infected with HIV would die, but then the HIV would try to infect other cells and it wouldn't be able to, and eventually the HIV would go away. So um, that's sort of what the, the goal of the study is. We've done, um, I think, about 10 patients so far. And so let me, I just wanted to explain, just to give you a sense of how this kind of thing works. So a zinc finger um, has nothing to do with HIV. A zinc finger is um, a type of um, trans, uh, transcription factor that's, that's uh, in, um, in nature. And um, it has zinc, and it has this finger here. And de um, depending on the amino acid sequence in this finger will determine what sequence of DNA it will bind to. So uh, a certain sequence of amino acids in that finger will make a certain zinc finger recognize GAT. A different amino acid sequence will make it recognize AAT. So theoretically, there are 64 possible 
kinds of things it could recognize. And this is a picture on the right here of a piece of DNA showing three zinc finger proteins that are, that are where the fingers are interacting with um, three consecutive bases of DNA. Um, and just to give you a, sort of, a, in a, sort of a, a better idea of what I'm saying is, if this is a finger here, um, you can see if there's an arginine uh, here, an asparagine and an arginine, and you can see the side groups here of those amino acids. When you have this, th these three uh, uh, bases, uh, amino acids in these positions, it's specific, the finger's specific for GAG, and you can kind of see why, because of the way the hydrogen bonds form between the side groups of these amino acids and um, the, nucle the, the, uh, the nucleotides. Um, and it's not that the, these other amino, uh, amino acids here are not important because they help position these three here. And then this is another example if you have an arginine, histidine, and a Q over here, how that would make um, the, this zinc finger specific for GGA. So, what if, so obviously nature knows the rules here about what amino acids to put in these positions to make it specific for a certain stretch of DNA. But if you could crack the code and figure out um, what amino acids you need to have here in a finger to make it specific for any of the 64 possible triplets, then you could design zinc fingers on your, uh, recombinantly that would target specific um, stretches of DNA. And then you could uh, link these um, zinc finger proteins to an enzyme that would do something like cut DNA. And it would lead to this idea of what they call genome editing, where you actually can edit someone's genome and, and destroy a gene, fix a gene, uh, uh, cut it and put a different base in and actually correct a genetic mutation and so forth. And so without getting into um, detail here, because that would take an hour into itself, one of the individuals who was involved in cracking this code is Carlos Barbas, um, and using a technique called phage display, which I use for making antibodies, he used it for a different purpose. He was able to create libraries of every possible zinc finger protein by um, creating libraries of where, where the amino acid sequences on these fingers were completely randomized. And using this method, which I'm not going to get into, he was able to identify what the amino acid sequence needs to be in a finger to be specific for each of the um, 64 um, possible um, uh, 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 triplets of, of DNA. And so he came up with tables like this where if you wanted to make a finger that recognized GAA, then the finger would have to have this amino acid sequence. If you wanted to make a finger that recognized GCC, you'd have these amino acids here. Um, and so this was a table for the 16 that will begin with G. And he made similar ones for the 16 that will begin with A and T and so forth. And so what you can do is design these uh, recombinant zinc finger proteins. And you can, you can actually string them together. So if you want to make a, a large protein that recognizes a unique nine, nine nucleotide stretch in a gene, you can link three of these together. And you just pick what sequences you want. And you can just make these synthetically. So this is just showing how. If you, if you make three of them, it'll recognize nine bases. If you take six of them, it'll recognize 18. And so why, why do this? So um, what you can do is you can link these zinc fingers to enzymes that will, that will cut DNA when they get dimerized. And so what, what is, this is showing is that if you wanted to make a, a, a cut someone's gene right here, you could design a zinc finger protein, four of them that recognize 12 bases on one strand, and then another one that recognizes um, 12 on the other strand. And this, uh, this, is a, this black circle represents an enzyme that will cut DNA only when two of them are near each other. And so by using two separate zinc fingers that recognize sequences on opposite strands, uh, and then are each connected to uh, an enzyme that will cut DNA, but will only do so when two of these black balls are right near each other, will give you incredible specificity for cutting only one unique gene in the human <coughs> genome. And what happens, it turns out, when you cut DNA that way, um, there's two things that can happen. Um, the cell, in trying to repair the break, can either stick irrelevant DNA in here, or 
it can, um, uh, it can create a gap. Um, and it, it doesn't fix it, which is great, because essentially it enables you to knock the gene out. And so what this is showing here is the chromosome that CCR5 is on. And this is the sequence of CCR5. And right over here is where the natural mutation is in the 1% of Caucasians that doesn't express CCR5 because of a mutation. And so uh, zinc, two single fingers uh, proteins were designed, one that recognizes um, the sequence on this strand and another one on this strand. And they were each produced recombinantly um, coupled to a, to a restriction enzyme called FOK1, which only cuts DNA when it's dimerized, when there are two pieces of it right near each other. So the idea would be to, for example, take T cells and somehow get these two zinc finger proteins to get expressed in the cell, have them go to the nucleus. They'll each find the CCR5 gene, bind like this, slice the, the CCR5 gene, and count on the fact that the cell will screw up trying to fix the break, and essentially would result in the cell not being able to express CCR5 again. So this was done initially um, in, my, in a mouse model, where patients came to the phoresis unit, and we freeze them. Um, they were transduced with the zinc finger proteins, um, the T cells. They were um, uh, with, infected with or without HIV. Various experiments were done. They were put into mice. And what was found was that, for example, this top line is the actual sequence of CCR5. And when you sampled various human T cells that, came, that were put into the mouse and grew in the mouse and were taken out, you see that in every case, they, the gene got screwed up. There was a deletion of one base here, two bases here, two here. Or in some cases, there were or additional pieces of DNA put in. But in every one of these cases, it messed up the CCR5 gene. So those T cells did not express CCR5 anymore, and they became uninfectable by HIV. So um, this was then done in, in some humans. And so a patient came to our phoresis unit, and we freeze them. Um, the cells were infected with an adenovirus that encoded both zinc finger proteins. Um, the cells were, uh, and the idea would be then the zinc finger proteins are expressed, they go into the nucleus, they bind to the CCR5 gene, they slice it, they screw it up. Um, those T cells are then expanded in the lab and then put back into the, into the patient to see what happens. Um, now, this kind of sort of gene therapy is, is known as hit and run gene therapy because one of the concerns about gene therapy is putting a gene into somebody and not knowing what other things it might do or how you would shut it off, whatever. But in this case, the genes that we're talking about are genes for these zinc finger proteins, and those genes actually never go into the patient. They're just used in the lab to slice the CCR5 gene, and then the cells are cultivated in the lab, and those zinc finger proteins don't, um, th don't get carried along. So there's no zinc finger protein DNA that winds up going back into this patient here. It's just cells that had, had their DNA sliced, messed up, and then that, that deletion is just inherited um, through subsequent generations of those T cells, but the zinc fingers are long gone. So it's, a, it's an example of gene therapy that really doesn't have a lot of the ethical and safety concerns that, that you might think of with other kinds of, uh, of uh, gene therapy. So. Um, there was a trial that began a couple of years ago, and basically um, there would be a patient who um, would get treated on day zero, and prior to that he would have leukophoresis, um, and the cells would be manufactured like I described, um, and there'd be quality control things done to show that they stopped producing, uh, expressing CCR5. They would be put into the patient on day zero. Um, they wanted to see that the cells um, homed to, uh, to the to to the GI tract where there's a, often a reservoir of HIV. And then the patients would go off of their, um, their heart therapy. It's called a structured treatment interruption, which is a typical standard way in which you assess new drugs for HIV. So they went off their, uh, their, their heart regimen for 12 weeks. And usually in about three weeks, the um, HIV uh, titer comes back up. And in this case, it didn't. Um, and these cells were actually there. Um, they were propagating because a lot more were there uh, after a period of time than were infused. And, um, and so eventually, as part of the protocol, they went back onto their heart therapy. Um, and so um, 
There are a number of additional uh, patients that are undergoing this, but what it, it shows that you can disrupt a gene, shut it off, expand the cells, put them back into people. They don't do, seem to do anything bad. They're the patient's own cells, except they don't have CCR5. There's nothing new in the cells. And the cells are uninfectable by HIV. So, so far, um, the, the results of these studies showed that the zinc finger modified T cells were well tolerated. They, um, they engrafted and they persisted for um, over a year, well over a year. Uh, they behaved like normal unmodified cells in their ability to traffic to gut mucosa. Uh, they expanded in the patient. Uh, they uh, improved uh, the overall CD4 T cell count and the ratio in a number of subjects. And then two subjects who had a brief 12-week in, uh, treatment interruption um, showed interesting patterns of HIV RNA appearance and then, and then decreased prior to the reinstitution of their heart therapy. And um, so uh, this um, uh, got a lot of press when some of the original um, data was reported. This one was a particular interesting um, report that I liked. Um, which kind of hit it on the head. Um, but um, one of the things that was, was published around this time, and some of you may be aware of this, was um, there was a patient in Germany who had leukemia and he had HIV. Uh, HIV. And so he got a, a bone marrow transplant that matched um, for his a HLA. But they were able to find a match that came from the 1% of Caucasians that um, lack CCR5. So he got a transplant from a CCR5 negative donor, and so both his leukemia and his HIV were cured. So this shows the, uh, the possibility that you could actually cure someone of HIV if you could repopulate them with CCR5 negative T cells. Now in this case, this, it's CCR5 every step of the way, every T cell uh, not just adult T cells from the ones we collected by phoresis. So what people are working on now is to try to do this zinc finger knockout business in, um, in earlier cells, in stem cells, not just in um, you know, mature T cells. But this, this, this um, accident sort of, of uh, or this fortuitous occurrence here with this particular patient lends credence to the idea that this thing could um, actually work in general. So, Getting back to the original thing I, I was talking about, which is you know, making the transition from just being a blood bank that collects and dispenses conventional blood products to developing to something where you're engineering cells, um, what do you need to do this? So, Because this is a lot about what we've been thinking about. So you need an infrastructure, personnel, equipment, space. So to do these kinds of trials, we had to put together a very elaborate system, an infrastructure, starting with the the uh, apheresis unit and the stem cell processing lab, uh, the general clinical research center where the stuff is reinfused, uh, and then some of the other sites that, that do this, Children's Hospital and some other places. Um, and then create a thing called the Good Clinical Practices Unit, which has a lawyer as well as a nurse who uh, is directing it and has a staff that, that uh, makes sure things are done according to uh, FDA regulations. And then they will oversee the actual CVPF lab that has a number of personnel, which feeds up to me and to the head of the cancer center. Um, Carl June is the sponsor of most of these trials, um, the head of pathology. Um, and then um, quality assurance people from on the outside. And then eventually up to the Office of Human Subjects Research. So there's a, a lot of work that has to be put into designing a structure in which you can get away with doing some of this kind of uh, stuff. Um, you need um, equipment, and a lot of this equipment doesn't really um, exist yet. And it's sort of um, taking things that are available and adapting it to these kinds of techniques, that, uh, t to work with these kinds of techniques. So um, uh, people who have, are familiar with blood banks would recognize a COBE 2991 cell processor, which is basically something in blood banks that we've used for decades for washing frozen red cells, washing away the glycerol. So We've adapted that to be used in these kinds of um, uh, laboratories. Um, a Fenwell harvester, which is basically a, uh, a phoresis machine that has the insides adapted for doing cell washing. Um, this looks just like a phoresis machine, except down here 
like this phoresis machine, except down here it has a cone which separates cells this way. Um, it's called an elutriation device for separating cells by uh, and harvesting them. Um, they're separated by, uh, by density. Um, and so adapting that kind of device for this, these purposes. And you wind up getting different fractions of cells out of the phoresis product. Um, and then this thing I mentioned before, which is uh, a cell saver device used in the operating room for uh, salvaging blood um, during an operation, but adapting that and using that as a cell washer. So there's clearly a need for new technologies and new devices to be made for these kinds of laboratories. This is an example of one tool, which I mentioned before, which are artificial antigen presenting cells to get the cells to grow in the lab. Um, they're magnetic beads that are coated with anti-CD3 and CD28, which stimulate the cells to grow. And of course, if you use these magnetic beads, you need to have something to remove them. So there are electromagnets in these devices that have been created to flow the cells through here to, to pull the uh, beads off. Um, I mentioned this before, these bioreactors. So if you're growing liters of cells, because these are not mouse experiments, these are human experiments. <clears throat> um, so these new kinds of uh, incubators have been designed that don't require uh, being in, in, a, in an incubator. They can just be on the bench. And they, they are sterile bags, and they're heated from below, and they rock. And they have tubes that feed the cells and put uh, various kinds of gases and so forth in, uh, in there. Um, another new kind of instrument is a flow cytometer that can sort cells in a sterile manner so that we can, uh, and we just got this um, from Beckton Dickinson. Um, it, so what it can do is instead of, um, if you have human cells and you want to um, fractionate them and with magnetic beads, you know, you can have one antibody on a magnetic bead and, and pull out CD3 cells or CD, you can't do multiple markers like you can do with flow cytometry or sorting. So here, uh, they're in the process of making clinical grade fluorescent antibodies for flow cytometry. And this device can allow us to do cell sorting with multiple different colors, just as you would do it for a, a research experiment. But the, the end product is completely sterile. The tubing, everything that sees the cells is disposable run per run in, in this machine. And we're looking forward to doing clinical trials that involve um, this kind of a device. So, the space. So this is how this CVPF started out um, when people didn't really understand you know, what the, the possibilities were here. Uh, it was basically a, a tiny little room with two hoods um, and some WD-40, which is probably very important. <laughs> um, and, and so that went into about 2004. And then we inherited some space from some other lab. Um, and a little bit of money was put into it to, to create these uh, a bunch of um, uh, High, highly, highly clean uh, rooms um, in a facility here, which is re fairly small. Um, you have to gown up to get into the room. Um, and, uh, and a lot of equipment fit in there. And that's essentially where all the, the uh, work has been done that I've been talking about. Uh, and so, um, like I mentioned before, what has gotten me thinking a lot about this is because we're designing a new one of these things, or an additional one of these things that um, is really designed from scratch for how to do this the best way. And so, um, so this is a, um, a, a, a diagram of part of the new unit, which uh, will have a, about, would be about five or six times the size. It will actually move our stem cell lab that we use for routine bone marrow uh, transplants into, this, into the same area. So everything will be together and a lot more efficient. And right on the other side, actually what these, right on the other side of this wall, what th these actually are the um, phoresis beds. So it's right next to our phoresis unit, right in the hospital, one floor below the operating rooms because we want to be able to get fresh tumor from the operating room to make, to process here and store for making those dendritic cell vaccines I mentioned earlier. And so this is something that we hope to um, have finished in about a year. Now, we're not the only place doing this kind of stuff by any means. Um, the NHLBI has organized a group of institutions that have labs like this, it's called Production Assistance for Cellular Therapies, that can do this kind of stuff for multiple um, uh, institutions. And you can see from the list here of the kinds of things that, um, and the potential, you know, the, the possibilities here for the kinds of diseases that can be treated using cellular therapies, it's enormous. And this is just 
um, something from 2009, and this is just the beginning. So uh, I think there's going to be incredible growth uh, in, in the area in which um, these personalized type therapies um, are going to be um, used. And so, in, in fact, just the zinc finger technology alone is currently being used for sickle cell disease, for slicing and actually replacing a, a particular base in a gene to correct not just not knock out the gene, but actually fix it and do molecular surgery. The technology is available to do that. And so it's really pretty wild kind of stuff. So, um, so just to summarize, um, you know, the role of apheresis has evolved to play a critical role in the rapidly growing field of personalized uh, medicine. Basic research into the molecular and cellular basis of cancer, infectious diseases, and genetic disorders Cardiovascular disease have expanded the role of apheresis to autologous cell-based vaccines and regenerative medicine applications. Apheresis clinics and cell therapy laboratories that had focused exclusively on what is now routine bone marrow transplantation and blood banking can now be described as cell engineering labs, where cells are isolated from patients, enriched, transduced, activated, expanded, and otherwise manipulated to change or enhance their function after reinfusion in the patients from whom they were derived. And so um, success will really require um, the working of transfusion medicine trained people because the, these labs are very, very highly regulated um, by the FDA. Um, they're accredited by FACT. Um, AABB is involved. As you saw, they're changing their focus. And so what better types of people than lab medicine people, transfusion medicine specialists, to be in charge of these kinds of things? You need to have people who know about you know, how to design artificial uh, T cell receptors and know about CCR5 genes and know about zinc fingers. So you need those individuals and, and gene therapists. So it's really a collaborative kind of thing um, that will require uh, um, all these different people to work together. But I, I really think that transfusion medicine should be the home for this kind of, this kind of stuff. Um, Fortunately, um, a number of things have collided, so we kind of have the nidus of people in these different areas um, at Penn to do this, but um, certainly this exists uh, in other, other places as well. So I think I'll end there, and if there are any questions. Yes. So um, with regard to the zinc finger approach for HIV, um, is it necessary to ablate the person's existing uh, bone marrow to do this, or do you have like a dominant negative way of? So um, that's not what was done in this study. Um, the idea was to introduce these um, these CCR5 negative cells, and the the patient cells that are still there um, that are that are not CCR5 negative are presumably infected with HIV, and they're going to die. Um, from the HIV, and the, eventually the HIV won't have anything to, to infect. Um, I mean, clearly in, in this bone marrow transplant guy, I mean, he had, a, you know, he had a bone marrow transplant, so anything that was there, it's a little different, obviously. It was, it was completely destroyed. But um, the results look really good with, with just, inf just taking the patient and just infusing these cells into the patient, not doing anything. No chemo, no, no nothing. So, yeah. As these products become more and more personalized, it seems like it must be harder and harder to fit them into some sort of existing regulatory framework for therapeutics. How much of a barrier is this in this domain, uh, sort of figuring out who regulates, if it's regulatable, getting shut down at the last minute? Um. Right, so I guess what you're saying is, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical company making gallons of one thing, um, you can make, you know, gallons and then take a little bit out and check it and it's okay and then it's assume this entire gallon that will treat thousands of people is okay. But in this case, every single one of these things is separate. And how do you, how do you um, control, how do you know they're each good? Um, and so that's the problem. Um, uh, I mean, that can be a problem. You have there's a whole bunch of release assays that you have to put into the protocols uh, to check the things you can check. Sterility is a, you know, a big thing. Um, a lot of testing that goes on on the individual products. Whether this is you know, something that's uh, sustainable that you, I, I mean, th 
So there were these three CLL patients done, and there's going to be seven more. Okay, but there were 5,000 requests that came in within 24 hours of that New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, so it's impossible to post, you know, it's impossible to to make these therapies for everybody. So how this is actually going to play out is hard to say. Um, you would see, think you need to get some kind of uh, companies involved, but um, it's hard to even imagine if this can make money. Um, you know, it turns out that this is cheaper than conventional therapy. Conventional monoclonal therapy can be um, $100,000 a year for life with a, something like Avastin. It can be $100,000 a year multiple times. This whole thing costs about $20,000 to make the cells for a person. Um, and it's supposedly a cure, you know, depending on what the disease is. So we'll have to see, actually, you know, um, once this, you show that this thing will work, how do you actually do it for lots of people? I, I'm not exactly sure. But then following up on that, so what is the regulatory infrastructure that you have to abide by? Well, the FDA. Yeah. Um, that's about it. You just have to make, you just have to, it's IDE or kind yeah. of, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I follow up on the T cells that you infused that were edited for CCR5? Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you got a 45 fold expansion. Mm -hmm. um, is that a result of the in vitro propagation of those cells? No, 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 they, they, actually they expanded in the, in the person. Hmm? Are they antigen specific and now fighting HIV because they resist the infection of HIV? They resist the infection because they don't have CCR5, but what their T cell receptors are against is, is just everything. They weren't, they weren't a special clone of, of T cells. They were just polyclonal T cells that were taken from peripheral blood against who knows what, whatever your repertoire is. And they were just made to be uninfectable by HIV. Um, and they were put in. Oh, so why did they expand, you mean? Um, I don't know. I mean, do they, I, I mean, I would think that perhaps they just divide and regenerate themselves, not, not like expanding, expanding in, term, in response to an antigen, but just uh, repopulating themselves. So then, then the experiment you did with the T body. Yeah. Um, the CD19 recombinant. Um, it seems to me that's a remarkable feat from the standpoint that you'd have to get sufficient expression that those reconstituted T cells are not going to be effective against the tumor, but not so not expressed to such a level that you get antigen or activation-induced death of the T cell. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of things. Yes. I mean, that's was this right? So this whole thing that was done was a phase one safety study. No one thought that it actually would do anything. And then, and then it actually was thought that it wasn't safe because these patients were, the three patients were getting admitted to the hospital really, really sick. And it thought, well, okay, so that's what happens when you're dying of the end stages of CLL. And, and everyone was really, really depressed until they looked to see that what was happening was, it was um, tumor lysis syndrome. And, and pounds of tumor was just, were just disappearing. And, um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that, that are just sort of aligned, I think, and then a whole bunch of other things that people don't really understand. I think it's clear that this 4-1-BB thing was the thing key to keep having the, the cells hang around, because other people apparently had done this without that, and the cells go in, and in 24 hours, they're not there anymore. So this 4-1-BB thing was critical to have the, the cells persist. Um, and the fact that they worked was, you know, everyone is just shaking their heads. And so whether this would work in a different disease or would work in the next seven patients, it's not clear. And again, you know, having destroyed all the B cells might be important too. And, and like I said before, then it won't maybe be effective at other kinds of cancers. We don't know. Yeah. Do you envision that for some of these personalized therapies, we might have banks of, for instance, MHC compatible um, cells that aren't necessarily the patients but would be expected to work with them that could be standardized and expanded and commercialized? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is one commercial, Dendrion. People know about Dendrion. So there's this one example of a company that was making vaccines for prostate cancer, and their model was to get pharesis products and, I guess, expose them to... Um, is it um, PSA that they use? You know, to a recombinant uh, prostate-specific antigen, would be PSA, um, and make and and so um, the problem. With, and I think that company is having problems. Um, one thing is that 
it only prolongs the patient's life by four months. So, and it costs a million dollars, I think. Um, and insurance, although they're supposed to pay for it, the, the physician has to lay the money out or something. So, there's some weird kind of thing. And so uh, I don't, they're having some issues. Um, but again, I, I can't, just prolonging someone's life by four months and going through all this is different than actually just curing cancer or curing HIV. It's a whole, whole different kind of thing. Yes, Cindy. <laughs> For the uh, CLL trial that you mentioned, how long does it take to, from start to finish to make the product? About a week. Just about a week. Yeah, about a week, or, about a week or two, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, I think. Yeah. So just to clarify, you can't put cells for one week, because when I was at the NIH a few years back, we were having to do two weeks of cultures to expand cells. It's one or two weeks. Were you using the magnetic beads? Right. Yeah, you got them, yeah. It depends. I mean, if it's a if it's dendritic cell vaccine, it's a little different than if you're if you're making lots of cells that for like the CLL thing that you're infusing. Mm -hmm.